Greetings, guys. This is Zombie Wild Man Hall from the Baby and Street Jacket Podcast. And today we're talking about what is the best martial art for self defense or best combination. So I saw a really great video about this recently, uh, and I'll link to it where Jocko Willings talks about uh, you know, the, the best self defense uh, or best martial art for self defense. And I decided to make this video because although I agreed with most of what he had to say, um, I, I disagreed with some of it. So I, I'd like to make this video just talk about my own personal opinion based off of my own personal experience. Now, unfortunately, for better or worse, I've been in three real street fights as an adult. Um, and that maybe is a, a story for another episode another day but uh the first one ended very quickly um i was at a heavy metal concert some guy kicked me in the stomach i turned around and punched him in the head i knocked him out with one punch that was the end of the fight i got the hell out of there so it, it was over almost as quickly as it started um the other two fights were violent they were scary and the way they ended was with the other person going to the hospital and me walking away. Um, and it, it was terrifying. It was terrifying what happened. Um, it was scary. It, it could have easily gone any direction. Luckily, it went in my direction because uh, for many years of doing martial arts, I was able to defend myself effectively. So when I talk to you today about what martial arts work, in a real street fight, fight, I'm basing this off of my own experience and also what I've seen. So, um, the first thing I would say is your best defense always is to be aware of your surroundings. If you can see the threat before it comes, that that is your best way to stay safe. You know, if you're walking down the road and you see, you know, a crazy looking person. You know, if they're homeless and talking to themselves or, or whatever it might be. Um, or you just get a bad feeling. Listen to that gut feeling. Um, you know, just avoid the situation. Don't go down that road. Um, don't go on that sidewalk. Maybe just turn around and go to a more well-lit place. Go to a place where there's other people around. Um, don't let the, the threat get close to you so that you have to resort to self-defense. Right. So your best bet is just to be aware of the surroundings, read people's body language, um, be able to interpret or are, are they a threat? Are they acting weird? Um, so I just I want to start with that. Your first line of defense is being aware. Um, it, it always will be. That will never change. Um, you know, situational awareness, uh, following your instincts, your gut. Um Having said that, um, I also want to point out your best bet for self-defense is a gun or some type of weapon or firearm. Uh, that is the great equalizer. You could be a five foot tall, hundred pound woman. Um, and if you have a gun, you can take out a, a 250 pound man. You know, the, uh, you could take out a, a real killer. Um, so, you know, you're serious about self-defense and you live in a country like the United States where you can legally own a gun, that is your best bet for self-defense. And once again, I highly recommend that you invest in time and training and owning a firearm, learning how to use it, uh, use it responsibly. And um, I mean, that's a true source of power. You know, at the end of the day, uh, if you have a firearm, that is real power. That's not perceived power. That's not interpretive power. That's not, that's not like you go to a court and the judge rules this way or the jury rules that. And that all that at the end of the day is backed up by violence. And that violence is backed up by weapons such as firearms and what else have you. Um, you know, dipl all diplomacy is based upon the threat of violence. Diplomacy can only exist because uh between one group and another negotiating, they understand that if they're not able to talk to uh, a common uh, consensus, a common agreement, 
that the the follow up result is violence and people dying, going to war, whatever it is. Um, so firearms. Um, your next level below firearms is smaller weapons like knives, um, and, and other things like that. Uh, it's called melee weapons. Once again, uh, do you have a knife? I mean, even something like a butter knife uh, is surprisingly effective at fucking someone up. So uh, I, I really believe if you have a knife on you, um, that negates like 90% of all wrestling, 90% of all jiu-jitsu. Um, if you have a knife and they try to get closer, you just start poking them. Um and all of a sudden, all those years that you and me invested in learning jujitsu, learning, you know, uh, wrestling, whatever, that just goes out the door. And, you know, the rules have changed. Um, and I have an example of this. I had a friend who way back in the day was in the United States Army, and he was stationed in South Korea. And he got attached to the ROC Special Forces, um, which is another really – funny story I, I won't go into it right now because it's uh, a little bit longer but uh the short version of the story was he was on a training exercise um he met the rock special forces and they thought he was funny and because they thought he was funny because he made them laugh they requested his presence to be like an, an attache um to their unit so when they would go do black ops missions um he would go along with them. So so he basically spent two years in Korea uh, working side by side with the ROC Special Forces. And uh, if you don't know, ROC, ROC stands for Republic of Korea. It means South Korea. And the ROC Special Forces, in this case, it was Tiger Division, are possibly the most badass motherfuckers in the entire world. I, I mean, we're talking like up there with the Gurkhas and just like, I mean, the best of the best of the best, just bad, bad motherfuckers. And I think a lot of it comes from the fact that they're actively in combat. They have combat experience on, you know, as the, people don't realize that North, South Korea, DMZ area, that's an active war zone. I mean, there's, they're actively shooting at each other on a regular basis. So um, anyway, I bring up this whole story because I remember my friend, he, he was a wrestler. And, uh, they were out in some field and they were sparring. And uh, he did a double leg on one of the rock special forces, took him down the ground. Next thing you know, the guy had a knife out <laughs> on his throat. Um, and he was just like, okay, uh, we're, we're not going to wrestle anymore. We're just, it's okay. Let's okay, we're, we're done, you know? Um, so, you know, those rock special forces guys, obviously they're excellent with guns, all that. Um, but, you know, they, they have their Taekwondo, they, you know, and then they have knives all over them. This is what my friend told me. He's like, in their boots, up their sleeves, all of them, at any given point in time, they can pull out a knife. So if he gets past that pipe window range, uh, that they're poking you with something. So now we've gone past uh, you know, uh, situational awareness, firearms, knives, and melee weapons. So let's get down, down to the actual hand-to-hand -hand, uh, martial arts, right? So, in my personal opinion, if you're an average, average person, right, and just looking to learn self-defense, I think where you want to start is two years of boxing. Uh, you want to learn how to throw a punch, learn how to take a punch. Um, why do I say this? Um, I mean, it's common sense what I'm saying, but I would describe every street fight I've been in Every street fight, like 90% of every street fight that I've seen on video, in person, other people fighting in front of me, um, they're all pretty much the same. Is that the tension builds, tension builds, boom. People just start swinging for the fence. And then if someone can get the better of the other person really quickly in the first few moments, the fight ends. And if uh, neither one of the people are able to get the better of the striking usually there's a bunch of wild swinging and then there's what i call sloppy wrestling where they throw the punches and they just kind of collide you know chest to chest shoulder to shoulder they're off balance it's, it's just um it's almost like drunken fighting just even if they're not drunk just um so it's wild frantic swinging punching boom S sloppy wrestling 
Um, and usually when you end up in those positions, um, and, and trust me, you can look on YouTube, uh, Street Fight videos, and you see this happen a lot, where the position you end up in is like a Greco-Roman uh, upper body wrestling, where you're both upright and you go chest to chest. And then they start wrestling, right? And when they start wrestling, eventually they end up on the ground. And then once you get to the ground, if the fight's not over there, that then you go into what I call jujitsu land, right? So those are like I, I would say your three pillars essentially of, of hand to hand combat and training. It's going to be striking, but like I, I like to just say, like good solid boxing, being able to throw punches, take punches. Um, and I'm going to more detail with that too. Being able to wrestle. To be able to manipulate, make sure you end up on top. And the three, on the ground, jujitsu. What, what can you do once you guys both hit the pavement, right? So that's why I say I, I think the most important thing, if, if you're going to learn one thing, is boxing two years. Why two years? My experience learning new martial arts is it generally takes about a year of full-time training um, to get to a proficient level. Like, like a basic blue belt proficient level where you know the basics. And then usually that second year, if you can train for two years, the second year is going to reinforce what you learned during that first year so that you don't forget. It. If you train for only one year, what I found uh, and what I've seen is that you'll get good, but as soon as you stop, you, you it kind of disappeared. But if you can train for a solid two years, it tends to stick. Um, so I, I would go with, with uh, boxing. Now, you say, okay, what about Muay Thai? What about kickboxing? What about Taekwondo? So here's my issue with kicking in a street fight. Um, you do not want to go to the ground. Nine times out of ten when you're in a street fight, you're on some type of hard surface, either a concrete, sidewalk, asphalt on the street. Uh, you're at a bar or there's just a, a hard floor. Um, you're in type of some type of tiled floor, you know, some type of public building, public place. Um, you know, you do not want to go to the ground. Uh, and if you do go to the ground, you want to make sure the other person's underneath you because that ground is hard and it hurts, right? So, um, you know, where was I? Uh, okay, so, so yeah, boxing. Boxing, I, to me, is the ideal equilibrium between range, speed, and power. Something like an elbow has much more power, doesn't have the range. Um, something like throwing knees, incredible power, doesn't have the range. Um, throwing kicks. Kicks are great if you're good at them, right? I mean, we've all seen the karate movies from the 90s and stuff, or, you know, do the flying kick to, to the head. Um, the trouble is, one... If you get in a street fight, you're probably not warmed up, right? So you're not going to be as flexible. Um, if you're not as flexible, for, forget about even injuries. You're just probably – you're not going to be able to kick as high as normally you normally would if you're warmed up. Um, to, you're off balance. You know, like if, even if you land that kick, if they're just charging at you, you're getting knocked to the ground. Um, and, you know, the other big issue, you throw a kick, um, it's a little bit slower to target. Right, unless you're throwing like a quick leg kick, um, you're throwing from down here up there, right? Whereas a punch is just point A to point B, point A to point B, right? Um, it's it's already there, and you you can throw at least a couple punches in the time it takes to throw one kick, put it back down, plant your feet, get your balance again, do something else. So, yeah, for me, your fist is that ideal equilibrium between speed range and power right um and you know that's the thing with kicking kicking can be incredibly effective right if you look at mma all this stuff but um you have different ranges when you're fighting you have your kicking range which is your largest range right then you have boxing range then you have clinch range which is basically you know stand up fighting where you're throwing eat you know, elbows knees and then you have grappling range, which is basically wrestling, going to the ground, um, you know, grappling range, and and um, 
clinch range are, are kind of variations on each other, but you know, clinch is you're still standing up, still throwing gloves, where grappling is like you're actually just wrestling, going to the ground, tying each other up. Um, so, you know, based on my experience in street fights, and by the way, I don't know if you can see, but this right here, this knuckle, I broke that a year ago, shattered the knuckle in the street fight. Um, that was the third street fight I've been in. And uh, long story short, I, I was in South Africa, Johannesburg, South Africa, and uh, a guy tried to mug me with, with a knife. Um, and I shattered his the side of his skull and my fist at the same time. Um, but it got me out of the situation. I'm still here talking to you. I didn't get stabbed. So, uh, yeah, read Boom, boom, boom. Any case, uh, second martial art I've invested, um, wrestling. What I just talked about, wrestling, right? Like, uh, once you get past that that sloppy, uh, you know that that uh, that striking, you're gonna go into sloppy wrestling. So I, I actually am a big advocate, even though I haven't had that that chance to train uh, as much as I'd like to, uh, in Greco Roman wrestling. Because that's that's more often the position, type of wrestling position you're going to end up in uh, when you're actually street fight is that that upright posture. You're throwing punches, you kind of collide, and then you're fighting and twisting. Now, a really good alternative to Greco Roman is judo, and judo is basically you know with the the gi, right? But essentially, the, the movements are almost the same. It's a still it's leverage, it's flipping the person. Um, I think judo is a great uh, self-defense martial art uh, because if, if you get proficient in judo, you, you're able to just pick someone up in a fight and throw, toss them, throw them. The fight is over most of the time once they hit the ground. I mean, you're going to just... Um, as as uh, Andrew Wiltsey, uh, the, the you know very good Brazilian black belt, said... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt... From Ohio, but, um, you know, the ground is undefeated, right? I, I, the ground is hard, the ground's undefeated. In all fights, the ground is undefeated. So um, if you're able to, if you know Jew and you're able to toss someone, that's a fight ender most of the time. And also a lot of that movement you get into to jujitsu is that type of sloppy wrestling where you're you're trying to twist each other upper body wrestling. So I would lean towards spending two years doing uh either Greco-Roman wrestling or um, judo, but, but also just any type of wrestling, freestyle wrestling, folk-style wrestling, all of it's just going to be really useful, really great, because what you're learning to do is you're learning to fight for positions, right? You're, you're learning to manipulate the other person's, your leverage and weight to move the other person's uh, body and weight, and um, I, I think it's just incredibly useful to have a strong wrestling base. Incredibly useful. I'd, I'd highly, highly recommend two years of that. Awesome. Um, and then my third pillar of of self defense for an average state person is jujitsu. And what I love about jujitsu is jujitsu offers you a way to end the fight. Um. If you only know wrestling and boxing, your only option to end the fight is to beat the guy senseless. I, I've been there before. It's not easy. And it's not fun. It, you know, it's, it'd be nice to just choke the guy out, right? Um, Jiu-jitsu gives you options, right? Uh, now, a lot of the, the joint locks, like an arm bar or, or any of that stuff, I don't, I wouldn't recommend using them in a street fight. Uh, but where jujitsu is really, really useful is, is learning those chokes. Because you can choke a guy unconscious, do no real permanent damage as long as you let go once he's unconscious. And uh, you completely neutralize the threat. You haven't caused permanent damage to the person. Um, it gives you options. And, and I think that's the number one best thing of, of jujitsu is the ability to end the fight without just damaging the guy and bashing the brains in. Uh, the other thing, really, the, th the other thing I would say about jujitsu is that it gives you uh, the ability to fight from even the worst positions. Um, 
you know, you, you can be on your back, the guys on top holding you down, all this stuff. Jiu-Jitsu teaches you what to do in those really bad positions and how to get out and how to still be effective, how to survive those positions. Uh, I think of Jiu-Jitsu as like a life vest, like you know, a safety parachute, uh, a safety net. Um, Jiu-Jitsu is like, okay, how do I fight from the worst positions when the fight it's, it keeps on going on? We end up on the ground. How do I keep on fighting? How do I win this fight from the, these positions? And I love jujitsu. I, I love it as a sport. I, it's changed my life in positive ways. I'm a purple belt in jujitsu. I've done it for years. Um, just for peace of mind uh, and just for mental health. I love doing it as, as a sport. Um, but having said, my, given my previous experiences, uh, I don't believe jujitsu by itself is the complete uh, self-defense package. I don't think it's enough to defend yourself well um, in, in a fight situation. Um, I, I think the number one thing missing from jiu-jitsu, the, the biggest deficit is most people are really good jiu-jitsu unless they've devoted time to learning the wrestling and the stand-up, um, have very poor uh, takedown game. You know, a, a very poor wrestling um, because uh, because of the rules of sports jujitsu, because you're not getting hit, because you're not being rewarded with a lot of points or taking someone down. Um, you have a lot of people who just pull guard. They just go into these really bad positions because in sports jujitsu, you're not going to get hit. You're not in danger from those positions where in a real fight you are. And, and not only that, but in real life, what are you going to do? Are you going to pull guard on concrete? That is not a good strategy for surviving the fight. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah. In summary, um, it's my personal opinion. Like a good boxing basis, um, a good wrestling basis. You don't have to be the best in the world, but you just gotta have some basics. Be like a blue belt level. And just be proficient, and and a good jujitsu basis. Same thing, blue belt, and then. If, if martial arts are your thing, like for me, it's a way of life. It's something I've done for years. Then you decide to be a specialist in one of them. You know, maybe, maybe take it to a purple belt level with the wrestling or the jiu-jitsu or, or the boxing. Or maybe you learn Muay Thai with the boxing, right? Like add add those uh, kicks and knees and elbows to your boxing basis. Um, and, and, you know, just as a side note, that's something I've also noticed. So I, I fought Muay Thai before. I lived in Thailand for many years, and I did one Muay Thai fight. And prior prior to Muay Thai, I had 10 amateur boxing fights, uh, Western boxing. Um, so when I, I shifted over to Muay Thai, I had a strong uh, boxing basis. And what I found is it, it served me really well. It, it um As a basis... It really transferred over to the Muay Thai. Uh, but the Muay Thai, you know, adding the kicks in, adding some of the other stuff to the, the boxing that already existed, it was um, a, a very effective transition. Uh, that, you know, adding that to the boxing worked really well. And then in that case, when I was doing the Muay Thai, yeah, I was throwing some kicks. I was, I was doing some other stuff. I was blocking kicks, whatever. But really, my, my strength was the boxing. That's how I won the fight. Um, and then I just added the other stuff in, but really that was my bread and butter was the hands, right? So, um, you know, that's just something to consider. Also, if, if you think you want to become a, a box or a striker, um, and you're willing, you, you're planning to invest a lot of time, I, I would say still do two years boxing, then do the Muay Thai. Um, that's my personal opinion. That's what I've, I've seen that worked well for me, it worked well for some other people. Um, because you have really good hands, um, uh, and the other person doesn't really know how to defend too well, that, that can kind of neutralize it. And a, a lot of the reasons, so so especially in Thailand, that they have incredibly great kicking, great elbows, great knees, not so great hands. Why did they not have so great hands? Well, look at the Muay Thai fights. The only part uh, of the body that's padded is the gloves, right? The hands. So in a Muay Thai fight, a sanctioned Muay Thai fight. You can't can't do as much damage with the hands as you could with the kick or the elbow or the knee because those aren't padded, right? So because of the sports rules, it tends to um to not favor 
the punching with the hands because you can get more power from the kicks and other stuff. So, um, yeah, th there you go. I, th that's my pillars, right? It's, uh, we said situational awareness, firearms, knives, and then actually hand to hand, we're going to go with boxing, wrestling, jujitsu. And that's where I'd start. If you, if you guys, uh, Agree, disagree, tell me what you think is good in the comments. But uh, I'll see you guys later. Baby in the Straight Jacket podcast. Until next time.